Well, it truly is an honor to celebrate Bill Atkinson's 10th anniversary of entrance into eternal life with all of you. Where did those 10 years go? And anniversaries are great opportunities, aren't they? We all, we all know. They are opportunities to come together, to celebrate, to remember, to rekindle friendships, to tell stories, and to give thanks. We come here on this wonderful anniversary to give thanks for the life of Father Bill and for what God did through him. And we'll tell stories, tell great stories about overcoming incredible hardship, about finding joy in life and teaching at Bonner as alma mater, and parties down the shore at Ocean City, and doing the line dance at the Springfield, and weddings for family members, and all the many good times and, and tough times that we share together. We celebrate those stories. Those stories never die. And it's exactly what we do tonight. Monica said to Augustine, only this I ask, that you remember me at the altar of the Lord. And so we come back here 10 years later, not having forgotten a thing, re-inspired, faith renewed, telling good old stories again, like that beautiful gospel story, the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus' charge and direction to his disciples, to his friends, and to us. Who of us doesn't want to have a blessed life? Who of us doesn't want to overcome hardship and find purpose and meaning in this life on our way to the next? And so he told us and he showed us how to live. And it's tempting at first, isn't it, to think that maybe Jesus got it backwards. Because the world tells us what it means to be blessed, right? We're blessed when we win the game, when we get the promotion, when we get the A, when we make the money, when we avoid the accident, when our cancer goes into remission, when things go the way we hope and dream and plan. That's when we're blessed. It's not what Jesus said. And he said, blessed are you when you are poor. <laughs> and when everything doesn't go your way. And your hopes and dreams are altered, maybe radically altered. And you depend on me. And you depend on the people that I put in your life. To help you to pick you up, to give you strength, and to align your cross with mine. So the crosses that we share don't end on Good Friday. It's a beautiful gospel, it's a challenging gospel, and an even more challenging way to live. On this wonderful anniversary, we celebrate and remember how well Father Bill Atkinson lived those Beatitudes with help. It must have looked so bleak for Mr. and Mrs. Atkinson, for my brother Augustinians, for those who didn't know how to make sense of such a tragedy. St. Augustine says, do not judge people by what they appear to be, 
but rather by what they can be. With the eyes of faith to try to see the potential and the possibility that lies beneath the surface that's not immediately visible in the time, in the, in the moment. Mr. and Mrs. Atkinson, devoted, faith-filled parents, saw that possibility. As did the whole Atkinson family. As did the Mullins and the McCaffreys and the Harveys and the Delessandros and my brother Augustinians, many of whom who are here, and many of you who literally physically cared for Bill when he needed it most. Who saw ability when others saw disability. Who saw hope when others saw despair. And Jesus sees this way and you saw this way. And Father Bill Atkinson saw it that way. And we know because he told us, he said that he was blessed. In the face of it all, he still said he was blessed. And more importantly, by the way he lived his life, he showed us how blessed he was and from whom he took his strength. Every morning, for as long as I knew him, when he woke up, there was a wooden sign on a wall opposite his bed with another quote from St. Augustine. It said, do what you can and then pray to God for the power to do what you cannot. And that ratty wooden sign now hangs in the room of a Boston City firefighter who's married with three children who fell through the roof of a burning building and is now quadriplegic, searching for that same strength and faith and inspiration as he carries on in his life. And many of you know better than I the strength that it took to overcome just the daily day bed sores and fevers and infections and poor circulation and surgeries and maybe having to wait three quarters of a day to scratch your head. And he did it. And he made no bones about it, about how he did it. With the strength that he got from his relationship with Jesus Christ and the strength that he got from others. He was quoted in Steve McWilliams' beautiful book, Green Bananas. Every morning at six o'clock, I woke up under the crushing weight of the cross. And at 6.01, God sent me people to help me carry it. And he said, and, and, and he lived in such a way that it wasn't just to cope, but with your love you gave him hope. And so what we celebrate is not just that, that Father Bill found the strength, but then he turned around and he shared the strength with all of us and each and every single one of us and many who are here and all of us who are here and many who are with us in spirit were beneficiaries of that shared strength. Talk, talk to any former Bonner football player during Father Bill's 30 years 
and they will tell you who the strongest one in the locker room was, whom they never saw lift a weight. And it gives true meaning to that beatitude, blessed are the meek. And what true inner strength is all about. And the power of that can help us overcome even the darkest day or the longest night. As he ministered to a beautiful family who will tell you that for Father Bill, listening was much more important than talking. And maybe because he couldn't walk away or run away. He was stuck there. And so he would intensely be present and listen. Listen to us complain about so many problems that were so much smaller than his own. And he would listen and he would pray and we would walk away, not having been judged. And often it would dawn on us on our own, just who we were complaining to. And we'd recalibrate ourselves and give a certain perspective to our lives and our to-do list and all the many things that, that weigh us down in our lives. He did that as a teacher, as a brother, as an uncle, as a friend, as a servant of God. I know my own vocation is directly attributable to Father Bill. You say you're from Drexel Hill, they say, what year did you get out of Bonner? I didn't go to Bonner. I went to O'Hara, that's the anti-Bonner. But I knew Bill as a friend of the family who helped me beat the cover charge down the shore because you could ride in on the back of his chair. <laughs> and the next morning after a long night, when maybe you were just looking for a couple of Advil and a club soda, you piled in 50, 75, 80 into his living room and you celebrated mass on Sunday and you're reminded about how important it is to put God first in your life. And I wasn't the only vocation that came from Father Bill. You talk to people from Bonner, you talk to uh, friends of the family. Just three weeks ago, I got a letter from a former Villanova football player who is now a doctor in Pittsburgh and he said he played football from 1970 to 72 at Villanova when Father Bill who was post-accident in the seminary used to come to the field before there was the ADA and Americans with Disabilities Act when there were no ramps and no good parking spots he used to find his way down the field who before the accident had been volunteering at St. Edmund's home for children with disabilities. And Bill as a seminarian used to bring these young boys and girls to the games. And in, in the spring and the summers, he used to get these young Villanova football players to go to St. Edmund's and work with these children. And this now doctor said it inspired him to go into the field of research for muscular dystrophy to help children with disabilities find strength and healing. And he went on to say, he said, from that one team, he said six of their teammates went on to become doctors. He said, I defy you to find any Division I team that had six aspiring physicians on it because they were touched and inspired by the life 
and the spirit of Bill Atkinson and his call to service. Other vocations like weddings. I can remember him celebrating the wedding of a good friend and he'd come up, you know, with a twinkle in his eye and he said, you know, the only thing, the three things you need for a, a good wedding is a, a beautiful day, a beautiful bride, and a handsome groom. And then he looked at my buddy and he said, well, two out of three ain't bad. <laughs> and in an age where priests, you know, get a bad rap sometimes about preaching at weddings because we're the only ones that have pledged our lives not to be married. But he would sit there and talk about commitment and talk about keeping vows and talk about following through what you started and talk about forgiveness and talk about letting the small things go. And you knew you were in the presence of holiness. And you were inspired to take that gospel truth back into your marriage, your job, your everyday life. We could go on the rest of the night. Indeed, servant of God. And 10 years later, a talk of canonization that would literally make Bill Blush. And we had a relationship and we had a friendship with Bill, so do we really need him officially canonized? He's up there in the, in the, in the communion of saints. And we can pray to him and find intercession and inspiration and strength from Father Bill. But what about those people who come after us? who didn't have the opportunity to know or hear about such a special disciple of Christ. I think that's where we are now. The church needs to hold up, not just good people, but people who are heroic in virtue. So that others, generations long after us, might have the benefit of the friendship and the knowledge and the intercession and the inspiration of Father Bill. We didn't know Augustine, but we found out who he was. And then we joined him in his restless search for God. We didn't know who Thomas of Villanova was, but we found out. And then we join in that spirit of commitment to serving the poor. We didn't know who Rita was, but we found out. And we share in her spirit as peacemakers and in believing that nothing is impossible with God. Why not collectively pray? that generations long after us might be inspired by such a beautifully committed life. And so now, as we close in towards seven o'clock, which means two things. I've been talking too long, <laughs> and it's almost time for Jeopardy. a game that Bill was really good at. And it's nice, isn't it, to maybe have an image of, of Bill and Jack Denny getting ready to sit down for a, for a game of Jeopardy. Jack can take U.S. presidents for 1,000. Bill can take the golden oldies for 2,000. But isn't it interesting? As someone who loved the game of answers and questions and questions and answers. Never got hung up on questions like, why me? Or why do good things 
No, bad things happen to good people. He centered himself on the answers that he got from his prayer, from living the Beatitudes, and following the rule of St. Augustine. And he lived on those answers. The joy that can be found in a life with faith, family, friends, and community. An answer like our humble selves are better than any other version of ourselves we could have. A conviction that when we align our sufferings with the sufferings of Jesus Christ, we rise from the cross. Answers like a call to service, answers like love is a choice, and it's so much better than bitterness and cynicism. May people 50, 100, 150 years from now find those same answers in Jesus Christ when they simply ask the question, who was Father Bill Atkinson, OSA? And how did he do it?